Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you tonight again that we can gather in your name. We thank you that we can look into your word. We thank you, Father, for these letters that you handed down to us from our brother Paul to teach us and to help us grow and to know you better and to understand who you are. We thank you, Father, that uh, we can be here tonight and pray that you'd be in the midst of all of our discussion and everything we say and all that goes on. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, last week we covered the first half of Paul's letters. Um, I'm going to try to get through the rest of them tonight, of Paul's. And again, if you remember, we're doing them in chronological order, not Bible order. Anybody remember how they came up with the Bible order? By length. By length of the letter. It starts with the longest to the shortest. Finally, have a hand for me every day. Oh, did you have it? I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. That's it for me. So, you can go back again. Um, but they're not the order of chronological or any other grouping. They're not theologically grouped. It's simply they went from the longest to the shortest. Romans being his longest letter, and Philemon, I is the shortest. So, I wonder why they did that. Because they probably couldn't agree on any other way to do it. So, well, they knew people would get more bored if they got it. <laughs> Their attention span shortened. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't. It was just the way they did that. There was no, nobody's ever had an explanation. It's just the way it ended up being good. Um, uh, so which were the, the oldest two? Anybody remember? The review. First two that he wrote, letter. Mm -hmm. No, Acts, he didn't. Paul did not write Acts. Luke wrote Acts. We're looking at the letters of Paul. The oldest two are, you got to know, Galatians, what's Romans. up there? First and second Thessalonians were the first two he wrote. Then he wrote first and second Corinthians. But Galatians is disputed. Then Galatians is where I put Galatians. Now some will put Galatians as the oldest letter. There's just no way to know for sure either way. And as I've always said, the dating, especially what order the letters were written, has absolutely nothing to do with their content whatsoever. <laughs> That's just a historical thing. Um, and then we're going to get to where we're going to pick up tonight, which is Romans, which was the next letter that he wrote. Now, this letter was written by Paul. There is no voice from anywhere in the early church history that ever raised a question about the authorship of this letter. Um, there was never a dispute on this one. Everyone knew it was Paul. Pretty easy. He starts out identifying himself at the beginning of the letter. But everything in it, in style, the ultimate theology that he writes in other places, everything's consistent that Paul wrote Romans. So there's no, no argument over the authorship here at all. Um, now, when was it written? That's always a good question. Probably written around the early spring of AD 57 is when he wrote this one. He was very likely on his third missionary journey at this point. He was about ready to return to Jerusalem with the offering from all the mission churches for the poverty-stricken members of the Jerusalem church. Um, in... Uh, Chapter 15, verse 26, it suggested that Paul had already received contributions from the churches of Macedonia and Achaia. So he was either at Corinth um, or had already been in Corinth and just left there when he wrote this letter. Um, we don't know exactly where he was. Um, so he was either there... Everybody places him usually in Corinth or in Centuria, which is about six miles outside of Corinth. Um, and that is because if he has references in it to Phoebe of Centuria, but he may have been staying at her home. <laughs> I mean, that's where he wrote it. Uh, and Gaius was also mentioned there as Paul's host. And he was probably a Corinthian. And Erastus is also mentioned, and he, they believe, is a Corinthian. So, most likely he was in Corinth or around, somewhere around Corinth, the suburb of the area. Guess who the original re recipients of this letter were? 
This is not a trick question. <laughs> he wrote it to the church in Rome. <laughs> so that's where it gets its name from, Romans. Um, now, the church in Rome was predominantly a Gentile church. Um, however, they had a, a substantial minority that were Jewish in, in the church. Um, and Paul originally sent the letter to the entire Roman church. And afterwards, it appears from just some of the pieces we have in manuscripts of it that this letter got broken up into smaller pieces and distributed all over the place. Um, maybe for convenience sake, or maybe they had an issue with a particular church, so they cut that part out of Romans, which addressed that issue and just sent it out rather than the whole letter. Um, now, why did he write this letter? Um, I think I'm just hitting that thing so you know what's going on. Um, and again, if you can see where all that is, uh, Corinth, of course, Rome is over here, and Corinth is down here. Not that far apart, really. It is in his day, but... Um, now, I, like I said, it was probably his third journey. He was at Corinth. Um, his work in the Eastern Mediterranean was just about finished for Paul. He was wrapping up his ministry in the eastern end of the Mediterranean. Uh, he greatly desired to, befit, to visit the Roman church, had for a while he wanted to go there. Um, at this time, however, he felt he couldn't go to Rome because he had to personally deliver the collection from the Gentiles to the Jerusalem church. He felt like he needed to do that himself. So he had to go back east again before he could go to Rome. So, uh, Is it understood who founded the Roman church? And just there's so much tradition and hearsay <laughs> and uh, mythology in there, it's hard to know who really founded it. You know, if it was an apostle or one of Paul's peers or somebody else. It, there's several. There are multiple different versions of who did it, you know, from Peter to even Peter, they had him mm -hmm. do it, you know. <laughs> so it was not Paul. We yeah. do know that yeah. because when he wrote the letter, the church was already established there. Mm -hmm. He had never been to Rome, so he couldn't have planted the church. Um, but Peter was in Rome at one time. Well, Peter died there as well. He did. But it's not known whether he got there in time to find found the Roman church or not. Because okay. um, he wasn't there that long. Um, and again, we don't have a lot of details on Peter after you get out of what Acts tells us about Peter. We kind of lose track of him until we find out by tradition he dies in Rome. So he got there somehow. Yeah. Um, we just don't really know how. And again, so much of it is just it's steeped in church traditions. You know, if you ask the Catholics, they have their whole set of stories of who went where, when, and how they got there, and all the rest, and when it comes right down to it historically, and there's no proof. Uh, it's a good story. And it's okay. Nothing wrong with it either. Um, and if you check other church groups, they maybe because that's the Catholic version, they come up with a different version. You know? Um, and again, it's, it really doesn't matter when it comes to the content of the letters they wrote and what they wrote. Um, all we can go on is what we think we know in a lot of cases. And so for him, you know, he's writing, instead of going to Rome, he decides to send this letter to them. And it's in this letter also that he states that he wants to make a trip to Spain. So his intent, Paul's intent at this point is to go to Rome and then ultimately on to Spain. Uh, it's, it's interesting because you, you see that Paul begins to understand he's wrapping up his ministry in the in the eastern Mediterranean. So what does he want to do? He's going to go to the western Mediterranean and finish up over there. He's just he's not going to stop. He's always looking for what's next. And he was that kind of a guy. Remember when he got blocked going into one country and he said, "Well, can I go to this one then?" God blocked him there. So how can I go to this one? Yeah, he was just going to go until wherever God would let him go. And God had to constantly block him from going where he wasn't supposed to. Then he had the dream of Macedonia, and the man called him over there. That okay, I'll go there. He was willing to go anywhere, so he intended to make himself all the way around the Mediterranean, at least on the European side. He was going to get there if he could. And as we said before, there's no evidence, historical evidence, that we can place that he made it to Spain. But there are a lot who believe he did after his two-year imprisonment in Rome, when he was let out for a couple of years. There a lot of people thought he made a trip to Spain in there. He got it. He was going to get over there because he was so set on going to Spain. And usually, when Paul wanted to do something, Paul did it. <laughs> it got done. So, but he never wrote anything about it. Nobody 
at that point, Luke was no longer going with him, so we don't know for sure whether he made it to Spain. But in the Roman letter, he expresses his desire to get to Spain, and he'd stop off in Rome on the way. Um, now, this letter serves as a careful and a systematic theology, um, really, of our beliefs. It's, it's, he lays it out as clearly as he can in the whole concept of what Christians should be believing in, in the book of Romans. Um, it's a great place for young believers to begin to go through and look at these things. Um, and so, because at this point, Paul is not directly associated or even has that much relationship with the Roman church, so he doesn't deal with any issues or problems. Because he may be totally unaware of any issues or problems. He's just writing for them a theology, a systematic theology of, our, of the beliefs that they should have. Um, so as we go on, um, Romans is the basic gospel to the Gentiles. The basic gospel is in the gospels themselves. But they're best understood by those who had some understanding of Hebraic you know, background and the law and all these things. Romans is the spelling out of that gospel to the Gentile world who does not understand all the details of the, the Hebrew laws. And because uh, when when you say the law to the Jews, they know exactly you're talking about the Mosaic and the Levitical laws. They know exactly what you're talking about. You say that to a Roman, and he goes, "What laws? Whose laws? Which laws? I mean, laws for changing in Rome all the time. You know, on the whim of an emperor. <laughs> uh, you know, originally the Senate, and then ultimately the democracy came apart, and the dictatorship took over of the Caesars, and then whatever." Caesar said, Caesar did. <laughs> and it became law um, to the point of being worshipped as gods. <clears throat> um, so he gives here God's plan of salvation and righteousness to all humankind, Jews, Gentiles alike. Um, now some have, have suggested the theme of this book as justification by faith, but it really seems to be much more broader than that. It's probably better off stated it is about righteousness from God. It's really what Romans is all about, that our righteousness comes from God. It doesn't come from ourselves, it doesn't come from what we do, it comes from the relationship with God, it comes from the relationship we have with Him. It includes justification by faith, but also he, has, he deals with the ideas of, and concepts of guilt and sanctification and security, all that is in the Roman letter. Now, his purpose for writing this letter are, are quite a few different ones. He wrote it to prepare the way for his coming visit to Rome and his proposed ministry to Spain. He wrote it to present the basic system of salvation to the church that had not received the teaching of an apostle before. As far as we know, again, nothing in the Cordesi says an apostle planted the church in Rome. So, where did it come from? Well, we don't know. <laughs> Somebody who got saved somewhere went to Rome and planted a church. <laughs> and it grew and developed and ultimately, which is really interesting, ultimately becomes one of the leading churches in the world of Christendom, one of the three major churches. The city of Carthage, the city of Rome, and, and Byzantine you know, are the three major churches in all of Christendom. And those three are the three looked upon, the bishops of those three cities, as the ones who can settle all disputes. If there are any. If those three agree, then that's that. And of course, ultimately, Rome decides to take the supremacy and become the first among equals. <laughs> and uh, then you have the development of the Roman Catholic Church, in which the Pope, who takes a whole different title now, um, is, is in charge of the church. And he'll do it by himself. He doesn't need the other two. Of course, Carthage falls <laughs> and loses its influence. And ultimately, uh, Istanbul will fall uh, as well. But, but it lives on through the Eastern Church, though, right? But it does the so Eastern then, Church, and then you have the schism, though, because the two aren't seeing eye to eye, and rather than solving their disagreements, they split. <laughs> but that's not until, you know, a thousand years later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's been quite a while before that problem occurs. Um, now, he also sought, uh, he also wrote to present the basic system of salvation. Okay, I already told you that one. He sought to explain the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles in God's overall plan for redemption. 
Um, in the Gentile churches, Jewish Christians were being rejected. <laughs> there was this swing going the other way already that, you know, if it was a majority Gentile church, why do we need the Jews? <laughs> kind of a thing. We don't need them anymore. It's just now for us concept. Um, and so he tries to make sure they all understand that it, it's for everybody. For both Gentiles and Jews. This is not either or. It doesn't have to be one and not the other. It's to be both. Everybody is to be included in this thing. Um, and the reason the Jews were getting kind of rejected is they were feeling constrained still to follow the law. They felt like they still needed to practice. They never, a lot of the Jewish believers never felt the release to just drop the law and not follow it anymore. They still felt like they needed to. A part of their heritage that was given by Moses to them as a people. And I, you know, that is where, even in today's world, if a Jewish person comes to me and says they've decided they're not going to eat pork anymore, I'm okay with that. It's fine. I'm not going to be offended by it. I don't have to put myself under that legalism, you know. But I certainly am going to force them to eat pork to prove that they're a believer. <laughs> you know that? No, yeah. You know, everybody has a set of beliefs. Everybody has, you know, convictions, personal convictions, and so forth. And that don't make any real difference in whether you're serving God or not. The real question is, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Are you learning to love one another? Are you being kind and and giving? And, and those, that, I'd rather see that than whether we're pork or not. I could care less about this. And Paul, in his letters, brings that kind of subject up a lot. Where he says, I'll be all things to all people. You know, and he says, you know, if someone sets food and sacrifice to an idol from me, I'm going to eat it with thanksgiving. But if it's going to offend somebody and it's going to be a stumbling block to somebody, then I won't eat it. You know, I, I'm just going to be careful with what I do. My job is to try not to offend anybody with what I do or cause someone to stumble. And I um, just had a conversation with someone today that, uh, on that whole subject. Um, you know, with living in Europe, people are going to be one way. The church will be one way. Here in the States, I'm, I act totally different. <laughs> the core beliefs never change. The whole intent never changes. But there's some things that are issues for us here that are not issues in Europe, and vice versa. And then there's issues there that aren't issues here. <laughs> and you learn to weed through, well, yeah, but what's the gospel say? <laughs> what did Jesus really say? What did he really mean here? And I'm going to be, you know, of no offense. I am free. The line we hear a lot of people is, well, I'm free to do whatever. And my response to that has now become, yeah, and I'm free to not do any of it. I don't How are have they to do different it. In, I'm sorry. Hmm? Go ahead. How are they different in Europe? What are a couple things maybe? That... Well, here, here in the evangelical South, uh, drinking is an issue in the church. You know, people don't expect their pastors to be drinkers. <laughs> uh, in Germany, after the service over, you, the pastors, the elders are going down to the pub to have a beer. <laughs> you know, that's, the way they, that's what they do in Germany. It's the way it is. And, and we're not talking the beer. We're talking the beer. <laughs> it comes in this huge thing that you go, I can't drink that. You know, I was thirsty. <laughs> you know? so, and uh, so it's just, it's different, you know, the same time. That the same group of people, now it's not so much more today, things have changed, but back when I was living over there, at the same time, they're all smoking a cigar. We're here, we say, oh, that's just not healthy, you shouldn't do that for your body, you're the temple of the Holy Ghost, and you, you know, well, they didn't care. So, yeah, <laughs> that did, wasn't an issue to them, just not. They don't see it as It's interesting, in Kenya, going to Kenya today, uh, we go there, and, and, you know, the big fad here in America is everybody needs to get a tattoo, right? The more you get, I don't know what the thing is, I guess whoever has the most tattoos in the end wins. Because I, <laughs> I, you know, it's, they are painting their bodies now like crazy. Well, here's the thing, in Kenya, in the church in Kenya, it's a sin. Mm -hmm. So you are, and when I see young people, especially Christian young people, confess they want to be missionaries and do this, and they're getting their bodies tattooed, you understand there are about a third or a half of the world you can't even go to now to minister. Because as soon as they see that, they're going to say, but you, look what you've done to your body. You're a sinner. <laughs> and, but if I'm going to be all things to all people, not having a tattoo, I don't think offends anybody. <laughs> but having one may. 
So I won't. I don't care what my opinion is. That's irrelevant. I've got to be all things and all people. And that's what Paul's trying to get across in Romans is, you know, it's about, you know, serving the Lord. It's not about all the details or following the law or the rest of those well, things. It seems like to me he gives a little bit of a history of God's unfolding plan. And instead of this tension of the Jews are right or the Gentiles are right or whatever, he says that's the mm -hmm. wrong question to ask because there was an evolution of God's revelation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the era, really, of, of Judaism... You know, understanding God's will and desire for our lifestyle was there, but it became such a legal interpretation yeah. that it missed the whole point yeah. of a healthy family. And so now we use the example of Christ, where we just try to emulate his lifestyle and thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and what you do with the meat sacrifice before idols is what Christ would do. You don't look for a law. Right. In a law to say, mm -hmm. do I do this or don't do this? You say... How would Christ do something for my family to help everybody be healthy? Right. And so that evolution, it looks like to me it's talked in here to say, let's not say who's right and who's wrong. Let's just celebrate together God's continuing unfolding revelation to us mm -hmm. of the wonderful big plan he's had for the whole length of mankind. See, he spells out again for the Gentile world in Rome, the plan from the perspective of it began with the Jews. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand that, then you're going to miss what all happened since, because it's so tied in to, you know, the creation story, followed up with the giving of the law to this group of people who were to be different on the earth, who messed up, God's redemption came back, they messed up, God came back again, restored, messed up, restored, messed up, till finally where, you know, so that people could understand the law doesn't do it. <laughs> you can't make it with the law, and then he brought Jesus into the scene, but Jesus took it a whole step further in saying that, yeah, but now there's no walls at all. I'm breaking every wall down. I don't care where you're from, who you are. You know, you know, it's for everybody because I'm paying the price. Nobody has to anymore. And so he's trying to do that through Romans, and, and that's one of the things that he's trying to do there. Oops, sorry, I lost it. Is to explain that relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles and God's overall plan of redemption. They're both in it. <laughs> They're both a part of the plan. It was not an either or. Mm -hmm. But that dichotomy was the Jews kept having that guilt feeling of we got to have some of the law. <laughs> it was given to us by Moses. How do we throw that out? And we, whether we want to admit it or not, those of you, however you were raised, if you were raised in a church, there are little things that got in you in that church you were raised in. That... Yeah, all of a sudden you go to a church that doesn't do that, and you be, what's the first that comes up in your mind? Are they really believers here? <laughs> you know, because they just don't believe that. You know, and I thought that was iron core. I thought that was the solid core of Christianity, and it turns out, you know, it was a tradition that got stuck in by somebody along the way, and it's kind of got enrooted somewhere mixed into the Bible teachings, in the doctrinal teachings. Um, and all of a sudden you go. And that's what going to Europe for me did more than anything else. It forced me to stop and really look at what does the Bible really say? Because <laughs> I think half the stuff we're doing in the church has very little to do with the Bible. And, uh, and half the stuff they're doing in those other countries has very little to do with the Bible. <laughs> the whole point is, is back to, well, what was Jesus doing? And what did he call us to do? You know, I don't know what their reasonings are. I've never looked into that deeply. Of course, the coming out of the animist background, if you look at, you know, you've seen the tribes of Africa, you know, where they're catching their bodies and putting big things in their ears, mm -hmm. and they, they connect it all to demonic worship. Yeah. So, so you know, if, you're, if you have a tattoo that says, I'm going for snakes. <laughs> they, they, won't, they won't let you in there. <laughs> well, they say it. They, they, the church itself, just which is far more conservative than our churches, would see it as a tattoo is not good. Yeah, that was yeah. It's just not positive. Yeah, I, I believe there's an Old Testament right. prescription against. Uh, right. Well, against that's disputable tattoo. too, because it, there's people who say that that has several meanings to it, and mm -hmm. and and I've listened to all sides of it. And you know what? It really comes down to personal conviction. I don't think you're going to hell if you get a tattoo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just don't. But again, it's why. What is the point? And what is the purpose? Um, God, I look at the, the root, and I really don't want to get into the tattoo issue here. But the whole root is God created us. He created us the way we are. Why do we think we can improve or change it? 
You know, whether we like it or not, we are who God created us to be. But if you don't believe in creation, and this is why the attack has been against creation, if we're just a product of evolution and development, and it's just, you know, we're all just another animal, species and animal, then you can do whatever you want to yourself and <laughs> make one little bit of difference. And that has crept in, at least in the fringe even parts of our thinking sometimes. And uh, so, but again, you, you, every culture has its own. I don't judge a culture because if a culture likes a tattoo or no. That's irrelevant to me. You know Jesus. <laughs> it's not good. The core question is, you know, because you can have a, you can be tattooed from head to toe and be a wonderful believer in the Lord. The problem you will have is there will be just some countries won't ever accept you in their church. <laughs> You're saying we can't tattoo animals, though. If you want. Okay. <laughs> if you really <laughs> want to like feel free. <laughs> If you want to waste the ink, go for it. No, it's going to hell. <laughs> um, now what, again, in Romans, the big theme of what he's trying to do is to get both sides to understand that everybody's in the plan. It's not an either or circumstance. You're either in, you're either Jewish or you're not, or you're and even today, in the, in the some of the Judaistic movements today, they're wanting to make everybody Jewish. Like, oh no, we don't have to be Jewish. If you want to be, go be it. That's fine. But don't make anybody else go that route, because it was given to the Gentiles too. We're both in the plan. It's all the way. And so, like I said, if, they, if I run across someone who feels like they got to follow the laws, go for it. You know, I'm not going to be offended by you following the law. Just know that I don't plan on practicing them all because I know I can't. <laughs> I've tried, can't do it. So I'm going to take the route of grace and mercy and just fall before the throne and let God deal with it. So <laughs> It seems to me part of the stress he was addressing was the Jews and Gentiles were saying, one of us has to be right, one of us has to be wrong. And so the other one totally missed the boat. If, if the Jews had done all this all along, well, then they must have been wrong all along. Mm -hmm. And what Paul says, you were not wrong all along. Yeah. This was a revelation that came to Jesus. He's taking us to the, to the next step of God's mm -hmm. revelation. You weren't wrong. If Gentiles don't do the law, it's not that they're rejecting what was given to the Jews at the time it was given to them. Right. And, and that's why I think he has to go through this whole historical thing uh, about that revelation of him. But his, you know, the themes that he hits, the theological themes that he hits in Romans are sin and death, salvation, grace, faith, righteousness, justification, sanctification, redemption, resurrection, glorification. Uses widespread quotes from the Old Testament. And his argument in Romans is really seen by so many as a really almost an anti-Jewish argument because he's pushing how it is for the Gentiles and you need to understand all these things. And yet it is also in Romans where he makes the statement he'd give up his own salvation if the Jews would be saved. <laughs> to let everybody understand. No, this isn't, again, when you, you, you're speaking to one group, a Gentile group, immediately, well, then the Jews are wrong. No. No, they're not wrong. <laughs> they are. They are who they are. And we are who we are, and we are all under Christ. And we are all in Him. But it's not a dual covenant thing. No. I mean, you don't want to get the impression you're saying that. No, There's one they all have to be under Christ. Jesus. It's just what they had done in the past was not wrong in the past for what they did. No. And if they even want to continue parts of it today, as long as they're not basing their salvation on it, it's not wrong to them. They want to continue to celebrate their feast. I think the feasts are great. I think they're wonderful. Our, like I've told you before, every year at Easter time, coming up in a couple weeks, we have a Passover. <coughs> That's not law. I mean, we don't do it on Passover. We do it on usually Good Friday night. Because it's convenient. <laughs> not under the law. But we do it to celebrate, you know, who Jesus is. A reminder. Something about, we didn't want an Easter bunny in our house. <laughs> that would be much better to bring a lamb into the house. You know, I could just make a little lamb and set them on the table, you know. Talk about Passover. Let's talk about what this holiday is really about for us. And uh, we'll celebrate Resurrection Sunday and celebrate the death and burial of our Lord. And, you know, because I like the Jewish feast because there's lots of food all over. <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with them. <laughs> but I'm not bound to them either. I don't have to celebrate either. <clears throat> I had someone, I, you know, we used to do the Passover here every so often, and you went again at some point. And I had someone, I said, you need to come to the Passover. And they were looking at me, I don't want to go, that's a Jewish thing. Mm -hmm. And I was almost taken back by that saying, like, what do you mean that's a Jewish thing? It's 
biblical. You know, and I stopped and thought about it. They're right. It is a Jewish thing. They were right. And if it didn't interest them, they, don't, they shouldn't come. <laughs> they were okay. Yeah. It's funny because a few years later, the same person came back to me and said, you want to do another one of those? I'm kind of interested now. <laughs> you know, I'd just like to see what it is. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> whatever. You know, it's, <clears throat> we put too much on what we do and not enough on who we know. <laughs> it's about knowing Jesus, knowing Christ. Um, let's move on to the next one here. Let's keep going. Uh, like I said, this is the most systematic of Paul's letters. <coughs> it reads as a theological essay more than it does a letter. <laughs> it's not a typical letter. He, he just, it's, it's like he's writing to school here, uh, two schools. It has a lot of emphasis on the Christian doctrine. Um, again, widespread use of Old Testament quotes, and he shows his deep concern for Israel. Israel needs to be saved, just like everybody else. And he's hoping they all do become saved. That's his goal, that's his thing. Because uh, he writes about Israel's present status, which at this point was not very good. Which still isn't to this day. <laughs> and her relationship to the Gentiles, how Israel relates to the Gentile world. But that the final salvation will be Israel's. Ultimately, they will be, <laughs> they will get in eventually ultimately, but by the same process, the exact same process that the Gentiles get. So, Romans, great book. If you haven't read through Romans, you need to read through Romans. It's, it really does cover everything. Um, the next set of letters are what we call the prison epistles, or the prison letters. Anybody name them? You know the ones we've already done, so it'd be the ones yeah. we haven't done, <laughs> and a couple others still left. But right. Timothy, nah, man. Mm. Ephesians. Mm. Ephesians. Ephesians. We got Ephesians. Yeah. What else? Philippians. Other Philippians. Philippians. Colossians. Colossians. One more. One more. One more. One more. Oh. Galatians. But. Galatians. It's already done. Galatians has already been written. Philemon? Philemon. Yeah. There they are. In all their glory. Misfortune or a blessing? Again, we what we look at is disaster is sometimes God plans as victorious. And you have to be careful. How do you view Paul's imprisonment? It's to Rome and he's stuck under house arrest for two years. Um, there are those who would say it'd been better if he had remained a free man, keep doing his missionary travels, gone all over the place. Look at the four letters we would be missing today <laughs> if he had not been in prison. Uh, this gave him time to really think these letters. They're shorter, but they say a lot, a whole lot, and uh, very key parts of our New Testament. Um, but then it raises the question, so did God stick Paul in prison? <laughs> no. You know, and that's the question it raises because, well, he used it for his, you know, put him there so he could write these stuff. So he must have stuck them there. You know, you're never going to answer those questions satisfactorily for everybody or anybody because there's always going to because you can go back and forth on it. What it is is Paul was, and this should be our relationship with the Lord. It should be the way we are in everything that we do, that wherever God places us, we're going to circle. Whether it's in prison, or whether it's out. Whether it's in this country, or whether it's in that country. You just serve the Lord. God's will is not a location. It is an attitude. But I will do whatever I have to do to get the gospel out. And Paul's stuck in prison, so the only way he can get it out, well, you have a couple ways, because it was a unique in prison, the first one. Mm -hmm. He was uh, you know, a house arrest. Couldn't leave his house. But he could have visitors. So, <laughs> and he had, you know, of course, he was chained to Roman guards. They didn't want him to get away. And yet, you know, they had to keep rotating the guards, apparently, because they kept getting saved. You know, he just, <laughs> he, you know, whoever was around him, he was going to preach the gospel to them. <laughs> you know, it's not, if I got an audience, if you're chained to me, I have a captive audience. So, and I'm not the one captive, you are. <laughs> so, um, so, 
this is a period, you know, that, that's clear here is he spent this time in a Roman prison. You get the story in Acts 28, 30 and 31. It was probably one of the richest times of Paul's life. You know, as he talks about it in Acts, and Luke reads about it in Acts, and then if you read these three letters, you realize his relationship with God really changes. It gets into another depth. And it was because he had nothing else to do but spend time with the Lord. A lot of time he spent with the Lord, and he really got some more insights um, that he may have not gotten if he was out. Um, it also, being in prison, gave him an open door into the emperor's household. Um, because of where he was and the people he associated with, word was getting to the emperor about what Paul was doing. So, you know, he could maybe it would have gotten to the emperor anyway. Because he was going to Rome to have his trial in front of the emperor, which he never did yet <laughs> until not so narrow was in charge, <laughs> and uh, he didn't still didn't give him a trial. He just killed him. So. Um, each of these letters contains references to Paul's situation in Colossians 1, 24, 4, 18. He speaks of his sufferings and his bonds. Philemon 1, 9, and 10 refers to him as a prisoner and one in bonds. Again, in Ephesians 3, 1, 4, 1, 6, 20, Paul makes mention of being a prisoner and in a chain. Uh, finally, in Philippians 1, 12, and 13, calls attention to his bonds in the presence of the whole praetorian guard. <coughs> Those are the bodyguards of the emperor were guarding him. So they were getting saved, <laughs> some of them, and then going in, you know, around the emperor. Um, so given all that evidence, of course, it is said that you know, these letters were written in Rome while he was in prison. Um, Colossians. We'll start with that one. Now this is one of two epistles written by Paul to churches he had not personally founded. He did not find the church in Colossus, nor did he the one in Rome. Those were the two he wrote to that he had nothing to do with their founding. Um, and it seems like that during his lengthy stay at Ephesus, uh, the message of Christ had been taken to Colossa by one of his fellow workers. He describes Epaphras, a Colossian, serving with Paul as our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. That's from Colossians 1, 7, and 8. Um, now, Colossae did not rank with Ephesus in size or importance. It was a smaller city. It was an inland city on a river between uh, Laodicea and Heropolis. Um, it was located on the main commercial uh, thoroughway through uh, east and west, getting to the coast to Ephesus. Um, you'd go past Colossae. It was just a city along the way. Um, let me see if I've got what I got here. Is, that's the name of the city, Colossae. Um, he probably wrote this letter around 60 AD. Uh, it seems to be the time of his imprisonment, to the best that we can tell. Um, several hundred years before Paul's day, Colossae had been a leading city in Asia Minor, which of course is Turkey today. Uh, it's lo located on the Lycus River. Uh, it was the main route from the Euphrates River to the Aegean Sea. So uh, that's why it was so important. By the first century AD, Colossus was diminished to a second-rate market town, um, which had been surpassed by its neighboring towns of Laodicea, which was one of the churches he wrote to, that John writes to out of Revelation, and Hierapolis. Um, its importance during the New Testament time was the fact that during his three-year ministry in Ephesus, Epaphras had been converted and had carried the gospel to Colossae. Um, the young church resulted, that being, uh, resulted from that became a target of heretical attacks, which led to Epaphras' visit to Paul in Rome, and ultimately he then wrote this letter in response to, uh, we'll talk about it some what has become known as the Colossian heresy. Um, let me see, I'm skipping stuff because we're running out of time. The Colossian heresy um, is a mixture of Jewish and Gnostic ideas. And we'll talk about 
talk about what those are here in just a second because they are this is one of the first great attacks against the church that is heretical that had to be dealt with by an apostle in this case Paul to, to straighten things out um, the unsound teaching sought to reduce Christianity to a, a legal system and to obscure the person and the work of Christ minimize who Jesus was and give you a bunch of rules this is what a Christian is um, that heresy never did go away <laughs> it's taken a lot of forms over the past 2,000 years but still around and that is why the key verse in here that he writes is verse 118 in which when he's talking about Jesus he says that in all things he might have preeminence <laughs> As he points out, you can never minimize what Jesus did. You cannot minimize his role. You can't take him out of the picture. D is the key to the whole thing. Um, here it is. You want to see Colossa? He's located right here. Um, with Ephesus right there. Just give you an idea where they are in the world. The Colossian heresy. Now, Paul never explicitly describes the false teachings that the address is in the Colossian letter. Um, so you have to infer what the heresy was from the, from the answers he's given in the letter. But pretty easy to do. Um, um, so what some of them were were this. Uh, the Colossian heresy. Uh, ceremonialism one of the main things. It held the strict rules of the kind of permissible food and drink, religious festivals, <laughs> circumcision. And this is a Gentile city. So <laughs> they were getting into all those things and placing all those rules back into the thing. Asceticism, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. That's how Paul deals with it in Colossians. He says, you know, there are those who say that. <laughs> and um, there was also angel worship. It was alluded to in the uh, second chapter, verse 18, Colossians. The depreciation of Christ, that's implied because Paul's emphasis on the supremacy of Christ. <laughs> he has got to be the Lord of the whole thing. Then there was the secret knowledge that shows up. Now, this is the Gnostic ideas. They boasted of this. Um, and Paul talks about Christ, in which he says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom. All secret knowledge lies in Christ. Him alone. <laughs> it's not something you can... You have Jesus, you have the secret knowledge. <laughs> it's all there. There's nothing more <laughs> that you can get. Um, and also, the other part of the heresy is the reliance on human wisdom and tradition. And you can see that in chapter 2, verses 4 and 8. Pretty clear what what does that last part actually mean? I mean, we live our lives living on you know, human knowledge and wisdom every day, you know, I mean, we use devices that are made based on human knowledge to help us. But their, What's their, the distinction? their Christian walk was based on uh -huh. human wisdom and your, the traditions. It's the way we've always done it. <laughs> Whether it's biblical or not is irrelevant to them. Whether it's Christ-centered is irrelevant. It's the way the church does things. You know, so it's the focus is, again, not on Christ, but on what you do. <coughs> It's putting us back in charge, and we will earn our way into the kingdom by what we do. A lot of that was cultivated in the in the Jewish group, both the secret knowledge through the mm -hmm. Merkabah and, and the, trying to find the throne room of God and the you know the wheels and different things like that. And the right. other thing was what involved in the speculative Kabbalah, which all has its roots back then. It comes back from when they were in Babylon. Once again, nothing is new. There is nothing new under the sun. Solomon said that in 900 B.C. You have to understand, there's been nothing new since then. There is no new religious heresies. There are no new distortions of God. There are no, it comes around and around and around. It takes a different name, different form. Always crack me up when people come up with the New Age movement. That thing is older than Moses. <laughs> you know, there is nothing new about the New Age movement. Spirit guides and that. <clears throat> Peaceful meditation. that has been around for centuries and centuries and centuries. You got writings go way back. So nothing is new. So all things keep popping up. When truth comes, 
Satan will immediately bring those in to distort the truth. And that's what happens here. Again, sure, Nazi, you can trace your Gnosticism to the secret knowledge of the Kabbalah from the Masons at the, the time of, you know, Moses on. Or, the, the Jewish Encyclopedia goes back and says mm -hmm. that the Jews picked it up from people from India yeah. and that Hindu teaching, like Bhagavad Gita and stuff, is mm -hmm. where a lot of that was taken. Sure. As well as, so even worldwide, you can see this whole common alternative path to, to knowledge apart from revelation directly from God. Right. And, and what makes it also dangerous and deadly is that within every lie there is a, a bit of truth. Mm -hmm. And what has happened is people discover the piece of truth in it. And because that's truth, then they expand on all of it, which none of it's truth <laughs> that they're expanding on. Mm -hmm. But because it started with a little bit of truth in the middle, it looks good. And people follow it and think that's it. They have discovered that. And that's why it's so sad when people are trapped by that because they think, they, oh, I've, I found this little piece of truth. You know, well, you can meditate all you want and you're not going to find true peace apart from Jesus. Yeah, you can get yourself into a semi serene state <laughs> until the next thing goes wrong. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but it's in Jesus is the one who said, My peace I live with you, leave with you not a piece as the world gives. And that only comes from him. My daughter called me the other day to ask about, you know, some stressful things going on, you know, and I just sit there thinking, work on your relationship with the Lord. Because <laughs> life is stressful. You can't get rid of stress out of life. But you can develop, or you can cultivate a relationship with God and his word that can bring an inner peace that helps you get through the stressful times. Because they're going to be there. I wish there was a way to eliminate them, but haven't found it if someone does write that book because you'll make a lot of money in this book yeah. with a book <laughs> so, um, now when you look at Colossians one of the things you can't help to avoid is how close it is really to F Ephesians um, when you read one they, are, they in fact some have called them the twin epistles um, they are nearly alike in the presentation of Christ his body the church in Colossians, Christ is the head of the body. In Ephesians, it is the church, which is his body. He changes the terminology a little, but he's saying exactly the same thing. Um, and then, you know, in his development in Colossians, he concentrates on the exalted position of Christ. And in, in Ephesians, upon the nature of the church, which is to be like Christ. And so, um, so in other words, the notable likenesses are throughout it, and it's very, very close. So if you didn't spent a lot of time coming up with new ideas for Ephesians. He wrote them basically the same ideas and concepts. Um, now the complete adequacy of Christ and the cons is contrasted with the emptiness of mere human philosophy. That is what he's pointing out in uh, Colossians. That all these other concepts, all these other ideas are just going to end up empty only place you get complete adequacy is in Christ. It is the only place it exists. Um, I'm going to move on because we're going to run out of time here. Got to get through these. The next one he wrote is Philemon. Um, now this is a very brief epistle. And this is a clear sign of Paul's personal correspondence. Um, he wrote this letter as one Christian writing to another. This one is not written to a church. He is writing a very personal letter here. Um, asking favor to be granted because of their mutual, mutual relationship to Christ and to each other. Um, it is a very masterful example of a tactful approach to a delicate and difficult situation here. There's a, a, this is a place for a lot of friction to take place among believers in this. And he finds a way to put a request out that is hopefully going to settle everything down and keep everybody at peace and find a compromise in the situation. Um, now the letter was sent along with, along with the letter to the Colossian, the Colossians to, um, to Philemon, in whose house the Colossian church met. So Philemon was in Colossus. And this is where it was. So when he sent the Colossian letter, he attached his personal letter to go with it, specifically to someone. Now, uh, he wrote the letter um, to a man named Onesimus. 
Um, a fellow believer in Colossae who was a slave owner, um, but not to Philemon, who he wrote it to, because about Onesimus, the slave, who apparently stole from Philemon um, and then ran away, which under Roman law was punishable by death. Um, but Onesimus met Paul through his ministry and became a Christian. And now was willing to return to his master, Philemon, <laughs> to go back to him. And Paul writes this letter as a personal appeal to please accept him back as a Christian brother. <laughs> now, you can see the difficulties here. A slave owner gets stolen, his slave runs away, steals something and runs away. He you know, has every right to kill this man under Roman law. Uh, he's a thief. He's a thieving slave, you know. And now he's going to come back into his house with a letter saying accept him as a brother. He'll be your slave still, but don't punish him. Basically, what Paul's saying, just let it let it go, and you know, see if you can make this thing work again. Um, so anyway, it was written around 60 A.D. same time because it was um, it was sent with the same other letter, and a lot comes out of this. You know, it's written very tactfully, but there's also a lighthearted tone in it. Because there's some word plays that take place in Philemon. <laughs> he's, he's trying to keep it not too heavy. Um, the appeal that he makes is organized in a way prescribed by ancient Greek and Roman teachers. It actually uses their culture <laughs> to argue this thing. And to build a rapport, then to persuade the mind. He follows this thing through it, then moves into the emotions. He deals with each one of the issues <laughs> along the way. Um, and he doesn't even mention Onesimus' name until all that rapport has been built. Then he brings up who he's talking about. So he set him up, he gets him in this letter, and he follows perfect Greek and Roman thought here. Uh, and then very much at the end of the letter, the end of that section, is when he appeals for Onesimus himself. Uh, hopefully by that point he's already persuaded him in his mind what to do. So. Great little letter, read it. When you read it, think about it in those terms as a personal letter. You put yourself in the place of Philemon, you're the slave owner. And think about how you would respond to that letter if it was written to you. Um, the next one, Ephesians. Uh, now, Ephesus in the first century AD called herself the first city of Asia. Um, although the ancient city of Pergamum uh, just to the north was officially the capital of the province. Mm -hmm. Ephesus thought they were. So <laughs> they had risen rapidly in their statue. They were an important center commercially, intellectually, religiously. Um, they boasted of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Diana, the great goddess of the city of Eph Ephesus. Um, For a long time, they were the second biggest city in the Roman Empire, weren't they? Yes. They, they grew rapidly. They outgrew everybody around them. They became the center in Asia Minor. For, if you're going to Asia Minor, you're going to go to Ephesus. They had to stop off there. Um, I'm just going to run through this quickly. Again, this letter was written around AD 60, the exact same time as the other ones. Um, Now, you can follow the history of the Ephesian church somewhat through the New Testament, reading through the whole New Testament and, and Acts. Um, he, Paul founded and established the church there. It's recorded in Acts 19 and 20. Um, they, he stayed there for two years and established this church. Um, they were well grounded in the faith. Um, the Ephesian epistle reflects the, uh, the, what they say is the spiritual capacity of this church. Because he goes a little bit further in Ephesians, talk, starts talking about things that he couldn't address the other, a lot of the other churches because it would have gone right over their head. You know, in Corinthians, what was he dealing with? Quit sinning, people. <laughs> Just quit yeah. sinning. I can't even get into deeper stuff because i got to get you to stop sinning first. <laughs> you know? Well, in Ephesians, he starts getting into the spirit realm and spiritual powers and possession. And, you know, he's... He's taking this, this church has the capacity to understand that. They're well grounded, they understand it, they're not going to run wild with that stuff. He's giving them an understanding of how the spirit realm infuses into the church and, and our worlds. Because um, he warns against conflicts with evil spirits. 
which were a menace in this city. Right. This city was loaded with evil spirits because it was a center of the worship of Diana. Right. You know, this, it was a hugely demonic type city. So they were running into demons every day. So he had to equip the church there to deal with this, deal with this issue. Um, now the letters to Timothy, who was left in Ephesus by Paul to carry on the work, show the next stage in the history. You know. False teachers that begin to trouble the believers. Paul sends instructions regarding sound teaching, proper organization of the church. In Revelation 2, 1 to 7, the last chapter written concerning this church in the New Testament. And it happens to be a very sad word, because she is the church that left her first love. It's the church of Ephesus. Um, she did not, when she did not repent of her condition, the church shows that she was removed, her lampstand. Um, so the witness went out in Ephesus. So it, it's a, it was a great city, which for the longest time had a great church in it, and yet the church ultimately lost its first love and became ineffective. And of course today it's in the middle of the Muslim world. <laughs> Now, why do you say you know for sure their last stand was removed? I know there's no warning in the past. Was that a witty? Yeah. Yeah. So, he did like how they fought the Nicolaitans. And stuff. Oh yeah. Well, they fought the demonic fights. <laughs> they took on the demons, but they lost that first love. The focus got switched once again. When the focus comes off Jesus, you're gonna lose. You might do some good things, some really good things, but it's gotta remain. On Jesus and who he is. Um, again, the letter identifies Paul as the author. He identifies himself. Um, now, he doesn't do a lot of the personal greetings um, like he does with all the other, a lot of his other letters, so some have used that as an argument. Maybe he didn't like it. Pretty weak argument. Um, so it's, it's well thought that he is the author here. Um, and Carson, like I've already mentioned, in Revelation. You want to see that there. Philippians. This was the starting point for the preaching of the gospel in Europe. Paul sailed from Troas, followed the Macedonian vision. Um, he arrived in this city uh, probably in 40, well, on this site in 42 BC, there was a famous battle fought here between Octavian and Antony and Brutus and Cassius, you know, all those names you've heard that you don't know, you know any of them are, but um, this. A Roman colony was established here, one of the earlier colonies of Rome, and of course wherever Rome established a colony, they never left. Back then they just stayed and ultimately took control of everything. And the city became modeled after, the, after an imperial city of Rome. Um, and the people born there were citizens of Rome, so they, and they were proud of their citizenship. Um, and it was on a trade route between the east and west. Um, we're really going to need to quit. So, <laughs> we'll get to the rest of them next week. So, there's a lot to cover in here about this city. It's important, an important city, and why 